Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Red Light Report. It's yours truly, Dr. Mike Belkowski. And this week, we're going to bring it back to the fundamentals just for a quick week. Every once in a while, as time passes on, I think it's good for us to kind of review the basics, and especially for those who have just joined us on the Red Light Report, because we get new listeners every single day. And so as the weeks go on, there's a ton of new listeners on the show, or to the show, I should say, that uh, may be new to red light therapy and don't understand the basics or the fundamentals. And as we all know, the basics and the fundamentals are necessary to really understand why red light therapy is so special, how it can treat so many different things, and once again, why it's so versatile, why it's so safe, why it's so effective, and I can go on and on and on. You guys get the point. And so I'm just going to jump straight into that. There's really no announcements this week. People are still loving the glow. Those that have just received it, they're loving it. I've been getting really good feedback. So that's always good for you guys to know. As always, going forward until they sell out, the Shine inventory is 20% off. No coupon code necessary. Just go straight to the BioLite website at BioLite.shop. And as always, I'll keep you guys updated as our up and coming new releases are around the corner. So as those come up, I'll keep you guys posted. And of course, I'll always give you guys a little discount for being loyal listeners to the Red Light Report. But for the time being, let's just go straight to the fundamentals. And what I mean by that is talking about the mechanisms of action as how red light therapy works. And this is coming straight from the book that got me hooked on red light therapy back in late 2018. Again, I got this book off of Amazon, not because I was looking for a book on red light therapy, but because... And in that period of time, I was just reading a lot of books on new holistic alternative therapies. And of course, Amazon is very good at recommending books based, <laughs> based on your purchase history or your, or your search history. And this book kept showing up time and time again. It's not like the title is that encapsulating or, or riveting. It's not like the cover of the book is necessarily going to pull you in. Again, not that you should judge a book by its cover, but there's nothing about the book that really grabbed my attention until I saw it time and time again. And the fact that I had so many reviews at five stars, I couldn't keep ignoring it. So finally, I added it to the cart, Prime Delivery, read that bad boy. And again, it was towards the end of 2018 that I read this book. And I was just tickled that there were a couple of really tight-knit connections between red light therapy and dry needling, which I specialize in. And of course, you guys have heard the story multiple times if you're a long-time listener, but my expertise in dry needling, I know how effective it works for relieving pain of so many different types. And in a couple of those mechanisms is reducing inflammation, improving circulation, relatively spontaneous whenever you insert a needle at a given location, especially somewhere along the nervous system. And those are two of the main mechanisms with red light therapy. So right away I was hooked because I had some familiarity with dry needling and its effectiveness. And so here's this relatively simple thing called light. And apparently it can do similar things, but without having to insert a needle, which as you can imagine, is a pretty big holdup and, and a friction point for, <laughs> for people getting dry needling therapy. A lot of them, most people don't get it done because of the needles. So here's this non-invasive yet very effective efficacious technique in red light therapy they can offer comparable benefits to that of dry needling. And then, of course, as you guys know, the, the cherry on top of it all was the red light therapy, the red and near-infrared light's ability to optimize the function of the mitochondria. And the more I dug into mitochondrial function and health and its impact on health and longevity and anti-aging, the more I was impressed with the red light therapy's ability to help in so many different ways. Many of you who are really into red light therapy are, are very familiar with this book. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Red Light Therapy by Ari Witten. And as you guys could imagine, with this being kind of the proverbial red light therapy Bible for the layperson, and not, not to mention there's a lot of scientific stuff in it as well. So it's, it's both for the science-minded person and the layman person just looking for some 
nice general overview of red light therapy without getting too deep into the science. Uh, Ari did a really good job with that book in that sense. Many of you are probably familiar with this book. And as you can imagine, I've reached out to Ari multiple times to get him on the podcast, but I have not gotten a response. And I partly wonder if that's because I'm the owner, founder, and CEO of BioLight. And in his books, he reviews a lot of the red light therapy companies and, and their panels. And of course, in this book, which was copywritten in 2018, was, was before BioLite was even around. I'm just wondering if he doesn't want to be on the show because he doesn't want to be biased to BioLite in some way, shape, or form. But regardless, I might still keep putting a bug in his ear to see if I could get him on here because he's just a wealth of knowledge in health and wellness in general, not to mention red light therapy and, and mitochondrial health altogether. Uh, so I'll keep trying to get in, getting him on the show. But regardless, I'm going to tap into the section of the book I think is really good for you, the audience. Even if you're really familiar with red light therapy, it's a great review. Those who are kind of in the middle, yeah, like you understand it, but you, you like to learn more. This is just good repetitive information to just further ingrain how red light therapy really works. I always like being reminded of how things work, red light therapy, different things in the body, physiologically, nutrition, supplements. There's just so much information, it's tough to remember it all. So being reminded and having information uh, repeated is never a bad thing. And so the area that we're going to focus on today, like I've mentioned, is the mechanisms of action when it comes to red light therapy. And, and for those interested in this book, if, if you're just joining or you're just new to red light therapy and you want to read more, I'll leave a link in the show notes to this book that you can just get on Amazon. Again, it's called The Ultimate Guide to Red Light Therapy. You type in red light therapy book, this is probably going to be one of the first ones that pops up. If you want a link, we'll leave it in the show notes for you. But moving along here, let's just get started. The main heading is two key mechanisms of red and near infrared light therapy. So having gone through this more complete list of factors and mechanisms, now I want to simplify and condense the science. I generally think of red and near infrared light as having two central mechanisms in how it benefits cellular function and overall health. Number one, stimulating ATP production in the mitochondria through interacting with photoreceptor called cytochrome C oxidase. And then number two, creating a temporary low-dose metabolic stress known as hormesis, which is also a primary mechanism of why exercise works, that ultimately builds up the anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and cell defense systems of the cell. And so again, those are the two mechanisms we're going to look into a little more depth here during this solo sode. So again, a mechanism one, increased mitochondrial energy production. Mechanism number two is hormesis. And so we're going to talk about each of those in a little more detail. So again, we'll start with mechanism number one, stimulating mitochondrial energy production. Researchers have found that one specific mechanism of red and near infrared light therapy is that these wavelengths of light are able to penetrate into cells and activate the mitochondria, directly leading to increased cellular energy production. Many lines of research indicate that the mitochondria are the key player when it comes to the mechanism of how red and near-infrared light affects our cells. And according to uh, Dr. Michael Hamblin out of Harvard and James Carroll, who is one of the, the pioneers of the current past decade or two of red light therapy, so Dr. Michael Hamblin and James Carroll, they go on to say that, quote-unquote, several pieces of evidence suggest that mitochondria are responsible for the cellular response to red visible and near-infrared light. The effects of red and near-infrared light on mitochondria isolated from rat liver have included increased proton electrochemical potential, more ATP synthesis, increased RNA and protein synthesis, and increases in oxygen consumption, membrane potential, and enhanced synthesis of NADH and ATP. This point deserves special attention because a huge amount of research in the last decade points to the mitochondria as being critical to health, disease prevention, energy levels, and longevity. So let's go into some detail about why mitochondria are so important. The mitochondria are the life-yielding, energy-yielding machines within the cells of all living things. Our mitochondria produce cellular energy in the form of ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate. 
Our bodies are constantly producing and using massive amounts of ATP in every cell in order to fuel every function in the body from breathing to thinking to lifting a dumbbell. Every time you breathe, digest food, your heart beats, or you perform a bicep curl, your cells are using ATP energy. All right, guys, as I promised, I am going to be offering you guys an exclusive 15% discount for the pre-sale order of The Matrix. Uh, like I spoke about earlier, this is a groundbreaking, innovative, patent-pending piece of technology from BioLite. It is literally a full-body red light therapy mat. You heard that right, a mat. It's a quarter of an inch thick. You can roll it up like a yoga mat. It has over 2,100 LEDs, and like all Bio light products, you have the option of choosing red and near infrared light combo, red light only, or near infrared light only. The dimensions are 69 inches by 34 inches, so you can either lay on it full body, cover it on top of your body like a blanket, roll up a section of your body, let's say your abdomen or one of your legs or one of your arms or a third or half of your body at once, roll yourself up like a bean burrito and literally give yourself a 360 degree red light therapy treatment. And more or less, you can think of this mat, the matrix, as the next phase of red light therapy. Because right now, everyone has panels and there's a time and place for that. But I think now is the time for innovation and moving the needle forward on red light therapy technology. This red light therapy mat, the matrix, roll it up. You can sit on it. You can stand on it. You can lay on it. You can roll yourself up. It's extremely versatile. It's easy to take on the go. So you're not just bound to hanging it up on a door or a wall. It's very easy to take on the go. Put it in the corner of your room. So it takes up minimal room in your house. The options are endless. Really, you guys, my loyal podcast audience, I'm going to offer you guys a 15% discount. And the discount code is simply podcast. So go to biolite.shop, check out the matrix. If you want this exclusive 15% discount, simply use coupon code podcast at checkout to receive that discount. And I know you guys are going to absolutely love this game changing product, the matrix. Our heart and liver are packed with mitochondria because they work constantly to pump blood, give life, filter toxins, and protect us from toxic damage. The brain is also packed with mitochondria. So are all of our organs, tissues, skin, and especially muscles which power us through movement. The mitochondria are the batteries that fuel all the processes of our organs. Thus, things which enhance the mitochondria translate into more cellular energy inside the cell which allows the cellar organ, again, the brain, heart, liver, skin, muscles, etc., to work optimally. However, since we don't get enough red light anymore, we are paying the price in the very core of our cells themselves, our mitochondria, the energy generators in our cells, and this has dire consequences for our health because we need red and near-infrared light therapy to generate energy efficiently in our cells. Thus, this lack of red and near-infrared light today impacts every organ and tissue in our bodies because every cell in our organs, tissues, skin, heart, lungs, liver, all contain mitochondria. This gives our heart energy to beat, our skin the energy to synthesize collagen more efficiently, our liver energy to detoxify, and so forth. To understand the detailed mechanisms of how red and near-infrared light actually enhance mitochondria, you need a basic understanding of how our cells produce energy. We produce ATP by going through a cycle of something called cellular respiration, which is what gives us energy to do anything. It gives our body energy to chew, breathe, sweat, produce hormones, everything. Cellular respiration has four steps. Number one, glycolysis. This is the first step in cell respiration, which is the conversion of glucose and sugar to pyruvate. Then we have pyruvate oxidation. This is the next step in converting glucose to ATP, which entails converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA to enable ATP to be manufactured. Number three, the Krebs cycle. This uses acetyl-CoA to generate a pool of chemical energy substrates. And then number four, oxidative phosphorylation. This is the last step in ATP production where the mitochondria use the chemicals produced in Krebs cycle to pump out ATP. And so this fourth stage, this last stage, oxidative phosphorylation, is when red light therapy, meaning the, both the red and the near-infrared light, does most of its magic. There is a crucial step in the production of ATP, 
when electrons pass through the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, and, and I'll take a step away from the book here and, and kind of sympathize with you because those especially that aren't scientific minded, this may be a little dry. And even if you're scientific minded, this can get a little dry, but, but just bear with me because this all will connect here as it relates to red light therapy. And again, this is the foundation. So this is important to know and, and understand if you can. And if it's a little confusing or a little too deep in the weeds, so to speak, then, then listen to this section a couple of times, because again, this is important to understand, and this will really expand your mind as to how red light therapy really works and helps with so many different things. Uh, so again, there's a crucial step in the production of ATP when electrons pass through the electron transport chain inside of the mitochondria. So as these electrons travel down this chain, protons are pumped across the inner mitochondrial membrane into the space between the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. This forms a gradient across the membrane, when, uh, which in chemistry and physics has what's called potential energy, since its substances at a high concentration will be driven to move towards lower concentration. And sure enough, the mitochondria harness this potential energy. As the proton moves back across the membrane to lower concentration, it passes through a little rotating motor called ATP synthase, which uses the energy of the proton moving across the membrane to power the process of producing ATP, again, that token of cellular energy. And so one of the key parts of this energy production in our mitochondria is a photoreceptor, cytochrome C oxidase, that helps oxygen be used efficiently by the mitochondria to power the ATP synthase pump. A photoreceptor is something that absorbs light photons. So again, cytochrome C oxidase is a photoacceptor, meaning it accepts light photons. And so the first law of photobiology states that for light to have any effect on a living cell or body, the photons of light must be absorbed by something in that organism or cell. So it turns out that there are indeed such things in many different organisms from plants to humans. It is well known by virtually everyone that plants have such a light photon absorber, chlorophyll, which is a chromophore light photon acceptor that turns photons into energy that the plant can utilize. What is not well known by most people is that humans also have light absorbing compounds, again, chromophores or photoacceptors, in our cells and our blood. Hemoglobin in your blood cells, cytochrome C oxidase, myoglobin, flavins or flavins, flavoproteins, porphyrins, and melanin in your skin, which is what gives your skin the tan. And, and as a side note here in the book, it turns out that even plain old water, including the water that fills our cells, is also a photoacceptor that absorbs certain wavelengths of light. And as it turns out that many of these light-absorbing compounds in our bodies have been verified by research to absorb certain wavelengths of light, and then translate that light into various biological effects. When it comes to red and near-infrared light, the photoacceptor cytochrome C oxidase in our mitochondria is of particular importance. Cytochrome C oxidase is part of the respiratory chain in our mitochondria that plays a key role in producing ATP. When red and near-infrared light photons hit the photoacceptor cytochrome C oxidase, it helps the mitochondria use oxygen more efficiently to produce ATP. If all of this seems complex, let me simplify. Mitochondria need this little enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase to bind efficiently with oxygen to produce cellular energy, or ATP, efficiently. And then red and near-infrared light helps make that all happen. So cytochrome C oxidase and oxygen working together well means good things are happening. Energy production and cellular respiration, which yields energy for the body and all its functions. When cells are functioning poorly, which most human cells are today because we live a life full of stressors like drop stress, toxins like BPA and pesticides and heavy metals in our food, too much artificial light at night, and air pollution, amongst other things, these toxic impacts hinder our cells' ability to produce energy. While the exact mechanisms are still debated, many researchers, including Dr. Michael Hamblin, believe that nitric oxide, or NO, plays a central role. NO, of course, plays many vital roles in the body, but when we have too much of it, or too much in the wrong place, 
or when our cells don't have the antioxidant capacity to quell the buildup of NO, it can hinder ATP from being manufactured in the mitochondria. How? Well, nitric oxide begins to compete with oxygen in the mitochondria. In fact, NO binds with cytochrome C oxidase, preventing it from binding with oxygen. It basically blocks the oxygen from being used by the mitochondria. Because of this, the NO inhibits efficient ATP production. Mitochondria cannot generate ATP efficiently without oxygen, so anything that slows oxygen from being utilized by the mitochondria will slow energy production dramatically. Therefore, in unhealthy cells, nitric oxide prevents cytochrome C oxidase from getting enough oxygen molecules. This hinders ATP production, which is a recipe for poor mitochondrial function and thus, poor cellular function. As shown by several research groups around the world, red and near-infrared light essentially prevents this pairing of NO with cytochrome C oxidase. It knocks the NO out and lets the oxygen in. So that's a big take-home point, guys, just to recap here, stepping away from the book for a moment, that the red and the near-infrared light disassociates that nitric oxide from cytochrome C oxidase to allow oxygen in so the mitochondria can utilize that oxygen to produce ATP. And so if we don't have that red and near-infrared light, that nitric oxide, which is bound to cytochrome C oxidase, disallows that oxygen from getting into the mitochondria, and thus with less oxygen, the mitochondria cannot produce ATP as efficiently. And as many of you have heard me preach before, from a bioenergetic perspective, the less energy we have per cell, the more disease we have. Or the more energy we have per cell, the less disease we have. So again, just simply looking at what the power of this red and near-infrared light is from a very basic mechanistic standpoint is that it disassociates nitric oxide from cytochrome C oxidase, allows oxygen in for the mitochondria to produce ATP more efficiently, and thus more energy per cell, but also with that nitric oxide dissociation, now there's more NO traveling around in your blood, which causes vasodilation, and thus that's where we likely get that increased circulation or improved circulation from red light therapy. So it does a couple of things right there by disassociating the nitric oxide. But let's get back to the book here. To have great mitochondrial function, we want to kick out the NO from the mitochondria and get oxygen in. This means oxygen can once again be utilized efficiently by the mitochondria, which then allows mitochondria to produce energy efficiently. In essence, red and near-infrared light therapy allow oxygen into the mitochondria and also prevent nitric oxide from halting energy production, which boosts mitochondrial function and improves the health of every organ and system in our body. I should add here that, to some extent, the nuances of all the exact mechanisms of how red and near-infrared light affect mitochondria are still debated among researchers. But everyone is in agreement that red and near-infrared light does indeed increase mitochondrial energy production. Also note that this cytochrome C pathway may not be the only way that red and near-infrared light increases cellular energy production. There are several more potential mechanisms by which red and near-infrared light can increase mitochondrial energy production that are described below, including increasing the size and number of mitochondria through hormesis, and more speculative theoretical mechanisms of how this type of light may interact with water in our cells and chlorophyll metabolites. See the section below on quote-unquote potential mechanisms for more on the evidence on the ways that red and near-infrared light may potentially affect our cells. This appears to be the major mechanism that drives many of the beneficial effects associated with red and near-infrared light on skin, muscles, bone, glands, and brain cells. In short, when mitochondria are stimulated, the cell produces more energy, and when the cell has more energy available, it essentially does everything better, heals faster, is more resistant to stress, produces proteins, for example collagen, and performs better, for example muscular performance. Mitochondrial energy production is the heart of all optimal cell function. Okay guys, so that was mechanism number one, and we'll move straight into mechanism number two, which probably gets a little less love in the world of red light therapy, and that's hormesis, or uh, what's also known as the hormetic response. 
So another key mechanism for how red and near-infrared light therapy work is through hormesis. Hormesis is the process by which a transient metabolic stressor stimulates adaptations that actually improve health. This may sound like an odd concept at first, but you're more familiar with it than you realize. Exercise is a type of hormesis. Exercise works by transiently creating metabolic stress, stressing out the body because workouts are hard, and temporarily increasing reactive oxygen species, aka free radicals, and then, in response to that stress, the body adapts to it with things like improved cardiovascular efficiency, improved blood delivery to the muscles, and by strengthening and growing the mitochondria. It also involves down-regulating the genes involved in chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, which are two key drivers of aging and disease, and upregulating the genes involved in energy production and the internal cellular antioxidant defense system. The mitochondria get temporarily stressed in a way that causes them to send signals back to the nucleus of the cell, which contains your DNA, and these signals are literally used by the nucleus to determine what genes should be expressed. This is called retrograde signaling. It's a remarkable phenomenon because most people think that our genes do all the dictating of what happens in our cells. In fact, mitochondria generate signals, based on the environment, that signal back to the nucleus which genes to switch on and off. In particular, the transient increases in reactive oxygen species, or free radicals, from red and near-infrared light activates many of the same cell defense mechanisms or systems that exercise does. The transcription factor, nuclear factor kappa beta, is activated through exposure to free radicals generated by red and near-infrared light, which promotes a very low-level inflammatory response. This then engages a mechanism called NRF2 pathway and the antioxidant response element, ARE, which is our internal cellular antioxidant defense system, which helps put out the fire by eliminating the inflammation and free radicals. In short, in much the same way that exercise builds your muscles stronger by temporarily stressing them, light does the same thing to our internal antioxidant and anti-inflammatory defense system. It helps make your cells more tolerant to stress, combats inflammation, helps prevent the buildup of free radicals, and ultimately makes your cells healthier, more energetic, and more resilient. It turns out that humans actually need some of these low-level stressors in their life. The absence of these stressors actually sabotages our health. Light serves as a transient low-level stress to your cells. The end result of these cellular adaptations to the temporary stress is healthier cells that produce more energy, have a stronger antioxidant and anti-inflammatory defense system, and are more resilient to overall stress. This is the same way that exercise makes us healthier. Red and near infrared light therapy also work by temporarily creating an increase in metabolic stress and increasing reactive oxygen species, just like exercise. In that sense, some researchers have called it an exercise mimetic because it mimics some of the same effects of exercise. And as you'll see in a later section in the book, research shows that it also combines well with exercise and amplifies the benefits on fat loss and muscle gain. So, red and near-infrared light therapy are also a form of hermesis and benefit the mitochondria by creating a low-dose stressor that the body then adapts to by becoming even stronger the body increases production of internal antioxidant and anti-inflammatory systems and builds up the size and strength of the mitochondria. In this way, red and near-infrared light become a powerful tool that doesn't just temporarily alleviate symptoms, like say an anti-inflammatory or painkiller drug, but it stimulates your body making lasting adaptations at a cellular level that lead to more resilience against stressors and a greater capacity to produce energy. And then we'll move straight into the last section in this section of, of mechanisms, which is entitled Potential Mechanisms. So in addition to these, what I consider to be the two most important general mechanisms, there are a couple of other fascinating potential mechanisms for how red and near-infrared light works inside our bodies. Some of these potential mechanisms may even revolutionize our understanding of human biology and how our cells produce energy. I list these as potential mechanisms because we have some evidence for them, 
but not enough yet for there to be a consensus within the scientific community that they are quote-unquote proven. Further studies are still needed for widespread acceptance of these physiological mechanisms, but they are incredibly exciting nonetheless. Potential mechanism number one, it interacts with water in our cells to produce more energy. Water itself is a photoacceptor. That means that water can actually absorb the energy from some wavelengths of light, including wavelengths in the red and near infrared spectrum. This may not be such a trivial fact. Why? Well, water fills our cells. While many people think of our cells as just bags of inert water, just a place for chemical reactions of other compounds to take place, this may in fact not be accurate. The water in our cells itself may be impacted by the light exposure in a way that affects cell function. That is, the water itself may have much more biological activity than we have previously thought. Researchers have found that when water that is next to surfaces that are biochemically similar to structures in our cells is exposed to red and near-infrared light, it literally changes the viscosity of the water. The water literally changes its thickness and its wetness. Think of it like this. Imagine swimming through a pool of water versus swimming through a pool of jello. It's a heck of a lot easier to swim through regular water than through jello, right? The point is that things that are surrounded by liquid, which need to move, will likely function a whole lot better if the liquid that surrounds them is not giving a lot of resistance. That is the basic idea here. A 2015 study published in Scientific Reports titled Light Effect on Water Viscosity, Implication for ATP Biosynthesis, suggests this may be exactly what is going on inside of our mitochondria. The researcher suggested that if this change in water viscosity occurs inside our cells, which is probable according to many experts, it may allow the physical rotation of the ATP synthase pump on the mitochondria, which again is that little motor on the mitochondria that actually pumps out cellular energy, or ATP, to operate more efficiently. Side note, this is likely related to Dr. Gerald Pollack's work on the fourth phase of water, or EZ water, which he has written a book on and done several interviews and TED Talks that can be found on YouTube. To some extent, much of this has in fact already been demonstrated, that light does in fact affect water viscosity when next to surfaces that are ostensibly similar to cellular membrane surfaces and that light increases ATP production. But as explained earlier, the conventional explanation for this is solely that red and near-infrared light impact the mitochondrial respiratory chain components, i.e. the cytochrome C oxidase. Based on their findings, the researchers of this 2015 study suggest that it may be due, partly or mostly, to how light affects the water viscosity in the mitochondria and allows for easy rotation of the ATP synthase pump. In short, the idea here is that the red and the near-infrared light penetrates cells and makes the water thinner and more slippery, so the little ATP motor in the mitochondria rotates with less friction and ultimately pumps out more energy. Again, this is a potential mechanism still, and we need more research to know for sure if this is in fact a major mechanism of action, but it's pretty exciting to think of these possibilities. Moving along to potential mechanism number two, interacts with chlorophyll in our cells to help our mitochondria produce more energy. For most of the history of biology, plants and animals have been thought of as autotrophs and heterotrophs respectively. Autotrophs are those organisms which provide their own food sources. Plants do this by capturing light and doing a process called photosynthesis, where they combine carbon dioxide and water and make carbohydrates and oxygen. Heterotrophs are organisms which consume other organisms for food. Thus, whether animals are herbivores, omnivores, or carnivores, they are eating other organisms to acquire their energy. For most of biology, we have generally classified organisms into these categories, but with some exceptions, we have called photoheterotrophs or mixotrophs. Most corals, for example, can both synthesize energy from the sunlight as well as consume organisms like plankton. Another example is the Venus flytrap and other insect-eating plants that can derive energy from both sunlight and from the organisms they consume. More examples include some types of non-sulfur bacteria, heliobacteria, many types of plankton, and even many types of insects. 
but of course, humans have always been conceptualized as purely heterotrophs. We need to eat plants and animals of various kinds to get our energy. Yet, I have already explained that hundreds of studies have now found that human cells, the mitochondria in our cells, do actually produce more ATP when exposed to red and near-infrared light. And it goes even further than that. A recent study has actually found that other organisms, including mammals that are biologically very similar to humans, like rodents and pigs, have now been shown to be capable of taking up chlorophyll metabolites into their mitochondria and using those metabolites to capture sunlight energy and amplify energy production. The research suggests that some animals can use these chlorophyll metabolites to speed up the rate of energy production and increase the overall volume of ATP produced by fairly large amounts in many cases. This revolutionary discovery was published in 2014 in the Journal of Cell Science in a study titled, Light Harvesting Chlorophyll Pigments Enable Mammalian Mitochondria to Capture Photonic Energy and Produce ATP. Specifically, it appears that chlorophyll metabolites in light may have some synergy that affects one of the key players in mitochondrial energy production, and that's CoQ10. A 2013 study titled Dietary Chlorophyll Metabolites Catalyze the Photoreduction of Plasma Ubiquinone found something remarkable. First, you need to understand a bit about how CoQ10 works in our cells. CoQ10 is often thought of simply as an antioxidant, but it is much more than that. It does many things that go far beyond just neutralizing free radicals. In particular, it acts to facilitate electron transfer in mitochondria to allow energy production. Now, in order for CoQ10 to do its work of facilitating mitochondrial energy production, it has to be constantly regenerated from its oxidized form, ubiquinone, to its active form, ubiquinol. When much of the CoQ10 is being oxidized, but it's not being efficiently converted back into ubiquinol, we get problems. We accumulate ubiquinone, and our ubiquinol stores are low. In fact, CoQ10 deficiencies are very common, and that's why there's so much positive research around CoQ10 supplementation. But what if the reason our CoQ10 stores, especially ubiquinol, are decreased in the first place is actually a deficiency in sunlight exposure and chlorophyll consumption? These research took dietary chlorophyll metabolites and mixed it with some CoQ10 in ubiquinone form. Then they exposed the chlorophyll metabolite and CoQ10 solution to the red light. Guess what happened? The ubiquinone form of CoQ10 was regenerated into ubiquinol CoQ10. But without the chlorophyll metabolites or the red light, no ubiquinone gets converted into ubiquinol. It turns out that light can actually interact with chlorophyll metabolites in a way that leads to regeneration of CoQ10. What kind of light has this effect? Well, as luck or biological design would have it, it's the kind of light that penetrates deep into our body, red and near-infrared light. And remember, most light only gets absorbed at the skin, but red and near-infrared light can penetrate beyond the skin, deep into our body. And I'm just going to step away from the book for a moment and make a point that uh, while Ari says the both red and near infrared light penetrates deep into our body, uh, that's not entirely accurate because red light, while it does penetrate deeper into the body than any other form of visible light, meaning green, orange, blue, indigo, orange, so on and so forth, while, while red penetrates deeper than those colors, it doesn't penetrate deep enough into the body to, say, stimulate the organs or the muscles or, or the joints. That's what near infrared light does. So red penetrates and treats the skin layers and, and the deeper skin layers, and then near-infrared light penetrates deeper to treat the tissues like the organs and the, and the muscles and the tendons and, and the bone and such. So just make that clarification. So back to the book here. In short, this research suggests that we are in fact designed by nature in such a way that the wavelengths of light that happen to penetrate deeply into the human tissues are biologically active in human cells and do a lot of amazing things, including interacting with chlorophyll metabolites and helping to regenerate the active form of CoQ10. The researchers of this study suggest that red and near-infrared light and chlorophyll may in fact be the key players in helping our cells maintain the proper ratio of ubiquinone to ubiquinol. But you might be wondering, can't this only affect the cells that light can penetrate into? 
and since red and near-infrared light can only penetrate a couple of inches into the body, this wouldn't affect all the cells of our body deeper than that, right? Well, interestingly, it turns out that ubiquinol can be carried in our bloodstream. So theoretically, the ubiquinol that cells produce could be carried to the cells throughout the entire body via the bloodstream. Hence, the light may have effects on all of the cells in our body, not just the cells that penetrate directly. And here is the astounding conclusion from these researchers of the previously mentioned chlorophyll study. Both increased sun exposure and the consumption of green vegetables are correlated with better overall health outcomes in a variety of diseases of aging. These benefits are commonly attributed to an increase in vitamin D from sunlight exposure and consumption of antioxidants from green vegetables. Our work suggests these explanations might be incomplete. Sunlight is the most abundant energy source on this planet. Throughout mammalian evolution, the internal organs of most animals, including humans, have been bathed in photonic energy from the sun. Do animals have metabolic pathways that enable them to take greater advantage of this abundant energy source? The demonstration that, one, light-sensitive chlorophyll-type molecules are sequestered into animal tissues. Two, in the presence of the chlorophyll metabolite PA, there is an increase in ATP in isolated animal mitochondria, tissue homogenates, and in C. elegans, which are roundworms, upon exposure to light of wavelengths absorbed by PA. And three, in the presence of PA, light alters fundamental biology, resulting in up to a 17% extension of lifespan in C. elegans, suggests that, similarly to plants and photosynthetic organisms, Animals also possess metabolic pathways to derive energy directly from sunlight. So I know that was a lot, but again, that PA, that's a chlorophyll metabolite. So essentially, by consuming more chlorophyll, they came upon the conclusion that similar to plants and photosynthetic organisms, animals also possess metabolic pathways to derive energy directly from sunlight. And so if that's not a good reason to be taking chlorophyll and spirulina and drinking some green tea for the EGCG, man, I don't know what's going to motivate you more. I mean, that's amazing. So by consuming those metabolites, that chlorophyll, spirulina, green tea, on a consistent basis, you're going to have that in your bloodstream and you're going to be more light sensitive and you yourself may become more photosynthetic and derive more energy from healthy light sources like full spectrum sunlight and then red light therapy devices, that red and near-infrared light, you may respond better to those treatments if you have that consistent intake of chlorophyll metabolites and, and the spirulina and EGCJ. I just keep saying those again because those are the three big ones. So just keep that in mind. It's very profound. And again, I don't know if that's been definitively proven that consuming those metabolites would lead to increased photosynthetic capabilities from a human being. But again, theoretically, and based on some of this interesting, profound research, there's definitely that potential. Moving along to the mechanism's summary here. In short, it is clear that humans can indeed harness sunlight energy and translate it into energy production by our mitochondria, either through the conventional cytochrome C pathway or through how light affects water viscosity and the ability of mitochondria to pump out ATP or by using chlorophyll metabolites to more efficiently produce energy or through increased production of CoQ10 in the mitochondria, or perhaps through some combination of all of these mechanisms. More research is certainly needed to confirm these speculative pathways, but they are certainly fascinating to think about, and if proven, they have the potential to revolutionize our understanding of human biology. Now, let's move away from the more speculative mechanisms and cutting-edge research and get back to the scientific consensus. The bottom line here is that we have scientific evidence for several mechanisms of how red and near-infrared light therapy can enhance mitochondrial energy production and overall cell function. In essence, what this all boils down to is that red and near-infrared light therapy help mitochondria produce more energy, decrease inflammation, and help the cell defense systems to increase resiliency. But as mentioned above in the list of factors known to be affected by red and near-infrared light, there are also many other mechanisms of action of red and near-infrared light therapy which researchers are still elucidating. 
it is likely that other effects on specific compounds such as BDNF, cyclic AMP, nitric oxide, etc., on stem cells and on hormones, DNA repair, or some other specific effects on gene expression also play a role in mediating many of the positive effects of red and near-infrared light therapy. The truth is that it's possible to get endlessly complex and nuanced about all the different molecular and biochemical pathways involved. An entire textbook could be written on the various pathways. One study gave a nice brief encapsulation of the mechanisms by saying, During near-infrared light therapy, or phototherapy, absorption of red or near-infrared photons by COX, or cytochrome C oxidase, in the mitochondrial respiratory chain causes secondary molecular and cellular events, including activation of second messenger pathways, changes in NO levels, and growth factor production. Near-infrared light therapy leads to the reduction of excitotoxicity, the production of neurotrophic factors, the modulation of reactive oxygen species, the transcription of new gene products with protective or proliferative properties, and the release of numerous growth factors for neurons and other cells, near-infrared appears to initiate a cascade of subcellular events which can yield immediate, delayed, and persistent beneficial changes in the injured neuron or other cell. So the reality is that there are dozens of signaling pathways in the cell and between cells that are affected by red and near-infrared light. But again, to simplify all this, most experts agree that the primary mechanism of action is how it works to increase mitochondrial energy production. In essence, red and near-infrared light fires up this engine of the cell, driving ATP production by the mitochondria. And since everything cells do depend on energy supplied by the mitochondria, red light and near-infrared light therapy have been linked with a wide range of amazing benefits, such as anti-aging effects in the skin, meaning enhanced collagen synthesis production and elastin production for youthful skin and dramatically reducing cellulite. Also, lowering inflammation, enhancing fat loss, enhancing physical performance and muscle recovery afterward, boosting testosterone, speeding wound healing, spurring neurogenesis in the human brain, strengthening synapses and spurring brain cell growth, helping prevent cognitive decline, reducing waist circumference and liberating fat from cells so it can be burned again, enhancing physical performance and muscle recovery afterward, enhancing fertility, combating gingivitis and promoting healthy gums, enhancing stem cell implantation and proliferation, enhancing gland health from the thyroid to the lymphatic system, clearing skin for sufferers of acne, rosacea, eczema, psoriasis, improving eye health, fighting chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, potentially helping the body fight cancer, removing wrinkles, lines, and veins on the surface of the skin, increasing energy, improving the appearance of scars, killing pain, protecting cells against the damage from stress. This list might seem too good to be true. How could one technology benefit so many totally different types of conditions? It almost seems to claim that it's a panacea, so it's only natural to express skepticism. Yes, the reason it can benefit all of these radically different conditions is actually quite simple. The health of every organ and every cell in the body depends on the energy produced by the mitochondria in those cells. Thus, because red and near-infrared light therapy work to enhance mitochondrial energy production in essentially every type of cell in the body, it can enhance the cellular process and cellular health of potentially almost every type of cell in the body. In essence, the basic principle is this. Whatever cells you shine it on, whether muscle, skin, gland, or brain, those cells will work better when the mitochondria in those cells are producing more energy. And so that's the end of that section of the book about the mechanisms and the potential mechanisms of red light therapy. So for most of you, I hope that was a little more detailed, a little more nuanced. You guys gleaned some more information of how red light therapy works and, and probably picked up some more detailed information on uh, the mitochondria and, and how it potentially works. And again, the, the whole concept of chlorophyll metabolites and how that can enhance your ability to absorb light and create energy without having to consume food per se, 
or even just by c- consuming those green leafy vegetables, that will also enhance your cellular production by being able to capture more light, so to speak. So it's all very riveting, all very interesting. But again, that's really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to understanding how red light therapy works and why it can treat so many different things. So again, I hope you found that interesting. Even if you have a lot of it was just repeated, I hope it just helped further ingrain those concepts of red light therapy. So anyway, as always, guys, thank you if you've listened this far into the episode. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you for your support. And lastly, as I always have to include <laughs> a little shameless plug as far as uh, having you guys just make a quick five-star review on either Apple Podcast or, or, or Spotify. And again, you don't have to leave a written testimonial. If you can f- feel compelled to do so, please do. But again, just, just take a quick 15 to 30 seconds and go leave a five-star review on Apple Podcast or Spotify for the Red Light Report. And again, this is not about me. This is not about building up my ego or trying to get me out there. It's more about getting the information out there, getting this podcast ranked so that more people can find it so they can learn about the many potential ways that red light therapy can impact their health. So hopefully they can take health back into their hands and not be relying on other people or the the allopathic system if they do not have to. Again, just taking health back into your own hands is is the main message. So please go leave a quick five-star review if you could. I appreciate you all regardless. Thank you for listening. And as always, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Get outside. It's springtime. Get out in that sunlight. Get that full spectrum sunlight. And as always, use your red light therapy as necessary, um, as an ancillary to, to your full spectrum sunlight. But as always, you guys have an amazing week and light up your health. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, Go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.